Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'm Jan Beagle, Director General of IDLO, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this first thematic discussion uh, of IDLO's Crisis Governance Forum. And the topic we've chosen is COVID-19 response and equitable access to health. The focus of this crisis governance series is on the crucial role that governance actors at all levels are called upon to play in shaping a response that fits the magnitude and the wide ranging consequences that the COVID-19 pandemic carries. And the underlying intent of the forum is to shine a light on the contribution that adherence to the principles of fairness and equality inherent in the rule of law can make to guide governance actions. The session will be recorded and the video recording will be made available online. And I'm hoping that we will be able to have a truly interactive dialogue. And for those of you who would like to ask a question to the panelists or make a comment, please let us know via the chat and we will give you an opportunity, as many of you as possible, to make interventions on screen during the question and answer period. As a New Zealander and a long time UN official, I am delighted that the Right Honourable Helen Clark, former Prime Minister of New Zealand and former Administrator of UNDP, the only woman to have headed that programme, has agreed to be with us today. Uh, Helen, your deep experience and your current engagement in so many aspects uh, of development and public health will be of great value in leading our discussion. And I'm thinking particularly of your roles as the board chair of the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health, and of course, most recently, as co-chair of the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response. And as our colleague, uh, Dr. Flavia Bustreo said recently on Twitter, thank you for your incredible energy engaging in these virtual conversations at one o'clock in the morning in New Zealand. We truly uh, appreciate it. I'd also like to welcome our other distinguished panelists, Dr. Mariangela Samao, uh, Assistant Director General for Access to Medicines and Health Products at the World Health Organization, Dr. Roman Makaya Hayes, President of the Executive Board of the Costa Rican Social Security Fund, Dr. Diane Etwene, Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Health of Uganda, and Professor Lawrence Gostin, Director of the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law at Georgetown University. Before giving you the floor, Helen, just let me say a few words to frame our dialogue today. We in IDLO believe that the road to good health and well-being, as expressed in SDG 3, lies in good governance, strong public institutions, and the rule of law and access to justice, as envisaged in SDG 16. And in halting the spread of the coronavirus and turning back the pandemic, we have seen that economic development alone is not the key factor for success. Recent events have shown that no one is immune to this virus. Instead, it is good governance, institutional capacity, and especially leadership that have made the difference. And public trust in state institutions is critical. Key factors in building and maintaining that trust include perceptions of the timeliness and effectiveness of the government response, the accessibility of health services, and visible equity in their delivery. We're all focused now on a scientific breakthrough to discover medicines to treat COVID-19 and a vaccine to prevent it, and there are promising signs that unprecedented national and international efforts will succeed. But when they do, it is essential that medicines and vaccines be accessible equitably and affordably, that they are treated as a global public good. The COVAX facility led by WHO, Gavi and CEPI, now involving more than 150 countries, is an encouraging display of international solidarity. Earlier this week, Secretary General Guterres called on all nations to provide further urgently needed funds the equivalent of the total spent on cigarettes worldwide for two weeks on behalf of global COVID-19 vaccine efforts to ensure that everyone everywhere gets protection from the virus. But ultimately, it is leadership. Leadership at all levels, international, regional, national and local, that will make the difference. And who better to address this than Helen Clark? Helen, you have the floor. Well, uh, thank you, Jan, and good evening, everyone from New Zealand. I've certainly learned in the course of 
life online during the pandemic that New Zealand is not the centre of the world, as one is either on uh, Zoom at uh, one in the morning or five in the morning. Uh, so uh, but great to be here and to, to share in the IDLO uh, event today. There, there are so many lessons to learn from how this pandemic has uh, played out, and I'll come to uh, some of those in the areas which uh, Jan uh, mentioned shortly. Uh, but uh, let's begin by saying that those who don't learn the lessons of history are uh, doomed to repeat them. And among uh, those lessons, uh, lessons of failing to be prepared for a pandemic, uh, despite uh, this being, by my calculation, the sixth public health emergency of international concern declared by WHO in the past uh, 17 uh, years. Another lesson is around the, the failure in many ways of, of global cooperation and solidarity at the scale uh, required. And a third lesson, and Jan alluded to it, is the uh, complacency uh, that we saw in developed countries as the disease uh, appeared in East Asia. In many ways, we seem to watch our TV screens as though this didn't have the potential to somehow spread uh, elsewhere in the North, let alone uh, the South. And of course, as we speak, uh, we're seeing reported uh, 34 and a half million uh, cases uh, and uh, a million deaths. And we know that's just the, the tip of the iceberg because so many uh, have never been uh, recorded. So out of the, the lessons to be learned, uh, certainly at the national level, is the need ongoing to have a flexible pandemic plan and to invest in the basic public health uh, infrastructure. Uh, that could implement such a plan. Uh, infectious diseases are not diseases of olden times. They are a challenge of the here and now uh, to all countries. Uh, having a plan in place that engages the public on the basic measures that they can take, which is such an important part of the story of, uh, of stopping transmission is absolutely uh, central. Uh, but it, it's clear that we can't just hospitalise and treat our way out of a pandemic. We have to aim to stop it in its tracks, and most especially for the, for the most, most vulnerable, which includes uh, the residents and care facilities and all those with health uh, vulnerabilities. Now, my lesson two uh, comes to uh, very much the heart of this seminar, and that is that it is very hard to implement effective responses without universal health coverage and without well-coordinated health systems across state and health district boundaries and between uh, central uh, and state, central and regional, central and local administrations. In fact, in a way, the more complicated the structure of a country, the more complicated uh, the response becomes uh, too. Uh, when you're fighting a pandemic, uh, health systems just can't leave anyone behind. And so if you are uh, an undocumented worker, say, with no health cover, uh, how, un how likely are you to seek a test when you're feeling ill vis-a-vis -vis going to work? Uh, if you're a migrant with no, no status or few rights, if you're a refugee or internally displaced person, how likely is it that you can be uh, tested and, and treated? So universal health coverage really has to be universal. It can't leave anyone behind, regardless of, of legal or documented status uh, in a country, regardless of, of socioeconomic or any other group in the community. The lack of universal health coverage will uh, contribute to spreading the uh, disease. So that comes to then a third very specific lesson, and that is to be effective in fighting pandemics. Uh, you have to uh, tackle health inequities uh, head on. And we have seen what has happened when the uh, epidemic has affected uh, demographics of the less uh, privileged. We see those disproportionate uh, death rates. Uh, the less uh, privileged in socioeconomic terms are often also those who, who are most uh, uh, hurt by the non-communicable diseases. Uh, whether those come from uh, poor nutrition, uh, from smoking or other drivers of NCDs. And one is struck uh, by figures, for example, like those that came out of Chicago, uh, where uh, African-Americans, which make up 30% uh, of the population, 
had 50% of the COVID cases and 70% of the deaths. That is, is really a, a very shocking and sobering uh, statistic. Um, health system planning also has been uh, shown wanting uh, where it hasn't been able to provide for health service continuity during the pandemic. And this has been uh, something very much on the minds of the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health and all our constituents, because we've seen the, uh, the consequences for women and children of basic services uh, not uh, operating uh, during the pandemic. Infants and children need their vaccinations. Uh, People, girls, boys, men and women need access to sexual and reproductive health services during a pandemic, uh, to contraception, uh, to safe abortion, to pregnancy care, to skilled birth attendants. Even a 10% decline in access to sexual and reproductive health services in, in low and middle income countries is estimated to lead to 15 million uh, unintended pregnancies 3 million more unsafe abortions, 28,000 maternal deaths, you know, the, the, the toll uh, goes on. So uh, providing for health service planning, which addresses the ongoing need uh, for services uh, in those areas, uh, let alone in the other basic services that people need on an ongoing basis is uh, so, so important. I think a, a vision going forward out of the experience of this uh, pandemic then must definitely have front and centre uh, rolling out universal health coverage. Cost must not be a barrier ever uh, to seeking uh, services. Uh, secondly, dealing with those health inequities, addressing the social determinants. Inequality is bad for health, uh, resulting in low income, poor nutrition, lack of education, lack of access to water and sanitation uh, services. Uh, all of these are, are barriers to getting on top uh, of transmission of a deadly disease. And I think a third priority must be the, the critical importance of engaging communities and mobilizing for health and being part of formulating and driving uh, health strategies, uh, which can reach uh, all demographics with the services that are uh, needed. Now, in, on the issue of governance, what we've seen during the pandemic is in countries with authoritarian regimes, responses have often been quite repressive and uh, have been a cover uh, for controlling for political reasons. So lockdowns imposed for COVID have also had uh, utility for repression and that uh, of course, is, is not uh, good at all. Uh, living in a small democracy, uh, which is uh, seen to have handled the pandemic relatively well, as well as one can, uh, of course, people in democracies are not used to restrictions on their freedom of movement and assembly. But these are extraordinary times. And in these times, if people are to be expected to accept these restrictions and the common uh, interest, leaders have to be very transparent and open to succeed with pandemic responses. They have to share the information they have. It has to be clear that they are listening to what the consensus of scientific and public health advice uh, is. Uh, I think for public, uh, they want to know that health security is being put first. And while you have in all countries a certain catch cry about, you know, uh, we have to put the economy first, the reality is clear to me that if you bungle a public health response, you will have deeper and more protracted uh, economic uh, damage. Uh, you need to ensure checks and balances around the extraordinary measures you're taking. And uh, in New Zealand, uh, throughout the, the period of very strict lockdown, which went for about four and a half weeks, the parliament uh, continued to have oversight, virtual oversight with a parliamentary committee hauling ministers, senior officials uh, before it uh, to cross-examine on the response. And of course, the courts were occasionally asked to review uh, decisions as well. Uh, but my impression is that the more open and empathetic a government is, the more likely it is that people will engage uh, with the decisions being made and the calls uh, for behavioural change 
And it's not a surprise to me uh, that a number of the countries which are seen to have performed quite well in this respect are led by women, because there is a leadership style, which is not exclusive to women, but is often associated with women leaders, which is more consultative, more empathetic, more collaborative, more likely to listen to advice and form judgments on that. And there's been a number of, of good examples of that kind from uh, women leaders. I guess um, just finishing on the last note uh, about the bigger uh, global equity uh, question. Uh, look, we are very short of global solidarity. Uh, the WHO launched uh, at the European Union uh, pledging conference back in May, uh, what they call this ACT Accelerator, Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator. And they asked for $35 billion. I saw Dr. Tedros uh, quoted as of late September, that th $3 billion had come in. I mean, this is truly pathetic. Uh, Jan, I think you quoted a, a figure that said that might be two days worth of spending on smoking. Well, I have another uh, comparison, and that is in my country, uh, the government's fund for COVID uh, response and recovery is around 32 and a half billion US dollars. That's for a little country of 5 million people. And the world is asking for 35 billion. I mean, please, this is the petty cash of what our world should be able to, to do. And we desperately need solidarity around that uh, access to COVID-19 tools accelerator. The other area where solidarity has been lacking is in uh, a response which really needs to be coordinated out of G20 of the scale required. And I'm very mindful uh, that in the wake of the global financial crisis, the G20 rallied uh, the trillion dollar package for the IMF and the, uh, and the bank uh, to uh, stop uh, low and middle income countries uh, going over financial cliffs. Now, this crisis uh, really pales into, uh, it put, puts the financial crisis crisis into insignificance in many ways. And it was estimated back in May that the international financial institutions would need two and a half trillion dollars to perform the, the bailouts and debt waivers and write-offs, et cetera, uh, concerned, uh, that's now thought to be an underestimate. But again, uh, we really are only seeing the petty cash. I think you know the IFIs have got the plans and the tools, but they need, they need backing for them. And my overall conclusion is that we really have lacked a coordinated response uh, to the pandemic. You know, we see the, the, the WHO, which of course has been on the case from from, from day one, and one of the jobs of the panel I'm co-chairing is to review what, what we can learn from that and what might be done better in future. But far beyond the WHO, what can be done better in future is, is at a global governance level. And I really do support the suggestion of Dr. David Barbaro that there should be standing capacity for a pandemic uh, emergency coordination council, uh, which could then act to support WHO uh, through the Secretary General of the UN, IMF head, World Bank head, DGWHO, working together through all their constituencies to cover the multiple dimensions of a crisis like this, because it goes so far beyond uh, what a health response uh, alone can do. And we won't get an equitable response until we get all those uh, players in alignment and adequately supported by, by member states. So uh, much to contemplate and, and many lessons out of, uh, out of what has happened. And we, we just have to hope that the lessons can be distilled, uh, recommendations can be based on them, and we can aim to do better next time because the damage wrought by this once in a century event, we would not want to see uh, repeated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen, for that very uh, insightful set of comments. I think the statistics you gave us were sobering, uh, both of the, of the numbers affected and the inequities among those numbers, but also uh, about the response. And I think we're all aware of that. I'm sure that much of what you have said, um, the lessons that you have drawn will have resonated uh, with our uh, other panel members. Um, the, the pattern that we are wanting to follow in this forum is to, to look first at the global perspective and then to um, 
have the perspective of national policymakers, you know, who are on the front line at their, in their particular countries dealing with the pandemic, and then also uh, an academic uh, perspective. And obviously our intent is to see how we can learn from each other's experiences, how the global policymaking can link uh, with national action and reinforce each other, and particularly um, coming to a point that you've made uh, throughout your intervention, Helen, how we can tackle the entrenched inequalities that this pandemic has, has exposed and, and, and exacerbated. So I'd like to start by turning to uh, Mariangela Samal. Uh, Dr. Samal, Mariangela, uh, it's really a pleasure to have you with us. Um, you have a long history in advancing social justice and countering inequalities and in access to health services in your own country, uh, Brazil, and also internationally. Uh, we had the pleasure to work together on these issues uh, in UNAIDS and in your current role, you have a really key responsibility of leading WHO's work in the area of access to medicines uh, and health products. And I hope you'll be able to share with us the challenges, but also the successes uh, that you've experienced in promoting equitable access to health services and products. And I guess in a perverse way, COVID-19 has been an equalizer. It's challenged in different ways health systems in countries at very different levels of economic and social development. And I wonder, what lessons um, you think that we can learn from this? Now, over to you, Mariangela. <laughs> thank you, Jen. And thank you, Helen, for the words as well. For those who don't know, Helen has agreed, and she's one of the chair, the co-chair of the independent panel that's uh, assessing the, pan the, the response to the COVID pandemic together with the, uh, President Ellen Sirleaf of, of Liberia. It's a pleasure and an honor to, to have you as the co-chair of this very important panel because, as you're saying, we, we should have learned yeah, I hadn't counted the number of pandemics, but I'm really <laughs> astounded to, to hear that we had that many, and it caught us so unaware in so many, so many ways. I think there, there are changes, Jen, that we see right now. Uh, I think we, we think of the world pre-COVID, you know, we, we think of what we're passing through now and what we, we should be also be laying out the foundations of how we use the, this crisis to give the best chances to set the foundations of, uh, of, of new ways of working for the future that, that would help us to, to face another threat like this. I hope I won't see another one in my lifetime, but who knows, right? And I, it's it's interesting because this morning I was on a on a trade panel, you know, with WTO, and it was uh, an event at the Geneva Trade uh, Week, uh, chaired by Switzerland, the, the ambassador of WTO in Switzerland, Canada, and others. And this was a, a a very interesting discussion because we saw it from the other side as well, right? And I think we we and I was saying there that for so many times we had the trade uh, interest and uh, the public health interest clashing, right? Sometimes they are convergent, but uh, a lot of the times they are they clash. They don't converge, and we sh we are seeing more of that during this this pandemic. I think we, when you're saying that this is a great equalizer, uh, in a way it is, you know, because uh, high, rich countries and developing countries are having problems, right? And uh, mature health systems have suffered uh, immensely. And I think what uh, Ellen mentioned about universal health coverage, there's not, it just should be a, an emphasis, further emphasis on the need for universal health coverage. Because even my own country, which has a strong policy of universal health coverage and universal access for uh, ever, everyone who lives in the country is fighting very hard every day to, to, to get control of this, this pandemic. But I, I'd like to use in our common past because I think lots of people in this panel, Jan at least and Helen, they, you are involved on in the HIV response, right? And, and HIV is also a pandemic. Right, which killed maybe 70 million people and has more than 34 or 35 million people living with HIV. But different from HIV, which developed slowly across the years, but for which we saw uh, initially, uh, initially no, but for five or six, seven years onto the pandemic, we saw more of a global solidarity approach 
approach. This one being a respiratory virus, right? It's catching everybody at the same time. So it's WHO has registered cases in all countries, territories, and regions. So there, it's ubiquitous. It, it's everywhere. Uh, and this is the reason why we are saying more than ever, we do need to find uh, global solutions, right? There, there are no, there's no nationalism that will help you, that will help anyone right now. I don't, the vaccine nationalism, I think it's a, it's a big threat for, uh, for the world as we, we, we think, right? So uh, that said, on, on, we saw, we, we are seeing things that I, I hadn't seen before. For example, uh, we are seeing the, the inequalities, they just became worse. The, the, what, the problems that we had, they just became worse. You know, the, the, the inequity in health and the inequalities in society, they just, it just made it worse. But we are seeing some things that we have never seen where you say you have the manufacture, the private sector, for example, coalescing around an agenda. You know, we, we have surprisingly, not, not everything is good, but it's surprisingly, we have some, some big manufacturers committing to uh, uh, cost, uh, cost plus, not, not for profit products publicly, right? Yesterday we had, two days ago, we had a UNNJ uh, side event on, on the ACT Accelerator that Helen mentioned, and we had two very strong uh, uh, statements from manufacturers, but we are far from it. So uh, the risk that we don't address this as a, a global problem that needs global solutions, and for that, the equitable access to safe, quality assured, and efficacious technologies is a must. I'll stop here because I think we still have some time to, to go across. And there are, although there is a better environment, collaborative environment there, we are very far from it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now have the pleasure to give the floor to the uh, President of the Executive Board of the Social Security Fund of Costa Rica, uh, Dr. Roman Makaya Hayes. Uh, he has been a leading figure in terms of the coordination of the response in Costa Rica, but drawing on a very long experience, uh, both nationally and internationally, including as uh, Ambassador of Costa Rica to the United States. So we're very interested uh, to hear uh, Dr. Uh, Makaya Hayes of, of the experience that, that you uh, have uh, had in, in Costa Rica and, and the way that you have uh, addressed uh, the pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jan Beagle. It's a, a pleasure to be on this uh, very distinguished panel with uh, uh, former Prime Minister Helen Clark, uh, Maria Gela Simao, Diane Atwine, and Larry Galston. Thank you for inviting me to be a part. Um, I'm going to show a few slides, not too many. Uh, let's see. Can you see it? Let me try again. No. Oh, here we go. Can you see it? Yes? OK. I don't think so. I don't think we can see the slides. You cannot see the slides. OK. No. Perhaps you could just proceed. I'm sorry okay. Well, I'm sorry. What? Uh, I don't know what's happening, but we can see an opening page, or we could. Mm -hmm. Let me try one last time, and if not, we'll proceed. No slide. Yes, there it is. Yes. Okay. Done. Done. Good. Terrific. Okay. <laughs> Well, um, what I'd like to go over is Costa Rica's response to uh, COVID-19. 
We had our first case uh, back in March 6, and at that time, um, we had a very, very strong response from the community. We have uh, communicated with uh, the whole country through daily press briefings in which we inform uh, the public as to what's happening, what, where the numbers are in all the aspects, and and where the science is leading, but also what are the best practices for avoiding uh, infection. And at the beginning, we had a very, very cooperative uh, population. I would say that today, although we still have a lot of cooperation from our society, uh, that is not as strong as it once was. And our numbers have seriously uh, deteriorated. We are usually uh, diagnosing about a thousand per day of new cases. And uh, although we have not saturated our hospital services, um, that is something that could happen in the next few weeks if cases continue to go up. Um, some of the challenges I have on this slide um, are very relevant today. One is our in, uh, limited installed capacity, primarily hospital capacity. And one thing that we said from the very beginning is that we will not beat this pandemic in the hospital. We have to beat the pandemic in the community. Um, and it's through best practices, it's through uh, social distancing, and also a strong primary care response. So we have the hospitals, but that's the last uh, leg of our response. Cancellation of procedures is also another big challenge in, in, in terms of having to postpone elective surgeries and all kinds of healthcare uh, procedures that um, are going to have a toll. And uh, this is something that we are well aware of, but uh, due to our limited installed capacity, we have had no, ch no option but to postpone many of these procedures. We have had to uh, spend a lot more uh, in this response on personal equi equi uh, protective equipment, all kinds of equipment for you know, ventilators and so forth, as well as investment in converting hospital infrastructure to adapt it to COVID-19 cases. At the same time, we're receiving less money. Our, our healthcare system, our public healthcare system, is financed primarily through payroll taxes. About 80% of our revenue comes from payroll taxes. And as our economy has had a, taken a hit from uh, the crisis, we have seen a decrease in our income, as well as macroeconomic shocks, shocks and uncertainty regarding how long the pandemic is going to last, how many cases are we going to eventually have to treat. I would like to highlight, however, one very strong advantage that we do have, and that is what we call una sola caja, one single public health care system. Our system is a single payer, single provider system. And so all of our public hospitals and clinics and purchasing and doctors and so forth are under a single administration. So we can reconfigure and redistribute resources, whether it's uh, human resources, equipment, hospital infrastructure, uh, according to the reality on the ground. And this has been something that we announced early on as, as one of our uh, advantages, and it certainly has proven to be the case, as we have had to um, reconfigure hospitals, reassign resources, without lengthy negotiations that can be challenged legally, uh, or coming into some sort of agreement between different owners or different stakeholders. Since it's all under one roof, this is when one of our big uh, advantages. As far as our response, um, there's two columns here. On the left is sort of more of the uh, operational response. We've uh, implemented a lot of telemedicine programs in, in a very short amount of time. We home deliver medications free of charge for all uh, chronic care patients, you know, diabetics, uh, people that have hypertension that we do not want to have them have to go to a pharmacy at one of our healthcare centers 
and possibly get uh, infected because they are the highest risk group. We have also, um, uh, we have a, a team of family doctors that follows up on the diagnosis for every case that's diagnosed and they answer questions, they orient how they should uh, care for themselves in their, in their house. And they are also on the lookout for any signs that uh, we should intervene and transfer them early to a hospital. Um, this is also, I'd say, help to kept our, our lethality uh, rates uh, relatively low. We have about a 1.1% uh, uh, mortality from those diagnosed cases that uh, we identify on a daily basis. We also um, have special programs to care for the elderly and indigenous populations and have increased in what we can in the short amount of time, part of our installed capacity. As far as more of the administrative response, we have um, increased the definition or expanded the definition of disability to include those that have to be quarantined so that they can receive uh, disability uh, income. Um, we have uh, reduced temporarily our contribution base, that is the basis on which the payroll taxes, the minimum payroll taxes are calculated in an effort to keep employers from uh, laying off uh, their staff and downsizing. We have also uh, our pension system offers home mortgages and uh, we have uh, reprogrammed a lot of these monthly payments to offer some economic relief to those mortgage holders. We have um, also uh, tried to do as much as we can electronically, all kinds of uh, daily or, or routine uh, transactions, for example, pension payments. Our population that receives pension payments is almost 100% uh, bankerized. That is that they, they all have bank accounts and so they do not have to leave their house to receive their pension payments. One uh, benefit of this crisis has been that it has, it has really stimulated um, research and innovation. We have had a number of, for example, just some, some examples here, a number of ventilators that have been designed in our universities. I know of at least four different designs that have been um, um, spearheaded. We early on uh, applied a convalescent plasma and then went on to develop uh, horse antibodies against the uh, key proteins of the virus and these horse antibodies that we usually use for snake bites and we've done this for over 50 years are now in clinical trials uh, in our hospitals. Uh, we are about to start the Respira research project which is uh, going to answer the question as to how long immunity lasts after infection. This is going to be a very large and important study. It is being done together with some of our local um, research uh, organizations, as well as the National Institute for Allergies and Infectious Diseases of the United States and the German Cancer Institute. And one, one thing I should mention is that all of our public hospitals and clinics and healthcare centers are connected electronically and everyone has an electronic record. So we can raise anyone's health, health history through our EDUS uh, electronic record system. And this system um, has a risk management uh, app that has been downloaded about uh, over 2 million times um, in a population of 5 million uh, citizens. And I'll end with this slide, which has been our solidarity call to action. This is basically trying to get the world to commit to pooling uh, COVID-related re technologies, what we call the CTAP and, and the WHO calls the CTAP, the COVID Technology Access Pool, as well as uh, the FACE initiative, which is the fund to alleviate COVID-19 economics. And so there's been some innovation as well on the diplomatic and multilateral front as well that we hope that uh, picks up steam 
so that uh, we can all get through this together. Because as we know, um, this pandemic is not over until it's over everywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Micaiah Hayes. Uh, I think we've all noted uh, one thing that you said, we will not beat it in the hospitals, we will beat it in the community. And I think that goes back also to what Helen said about the key importance of community engagement, but also noticing so much of what you said went beyond the health sector. And it's really a, a, whole, of, a whole of government, a whole of society uh, response, and also the innovation. Very, very interesting uh, to hear about that. I'm, very pleased now to give the floor to Dr. Uh, Diane uh, Twene, uh, the Permanent Secretary of Uganda's Ministry of Health. Uh, Dr. Twene has been a trailblazer for health and the rule of law uh, in her country and a, and a staunch crusader against uh, corruption in the health sector. And I know that she has been maintaining a strong focus on reforms to access um, health services and, and quality of health care throughout her career. And now the ministry is at the forefront of the response to the pandemic. So we're very interested um, to hear, Doctor, um, the lessons that Uganda is learning um, from uh, this experience of the pandemic. Uh, the floor is yours. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to join you this afternoon. And thank you so much for, for inviting us to be part of this and, and also uh, coming up with such an important uh, topic um, where we, we, we talk about human rights, uh, especially in, in, in this time of COVID. First of all, I want to, for those of you who may not know where Uganda is, um, Uganda is in East Africa. Um, uh, on the east, we have Kenya. On the north, we have South Sudan. Uh, in the western part, we have uh, Republic of Congo, uh, DRC. In, on, on south part, we have Rwanda and uh, Tanzania. And we, we are part of the bigger East African community that has about 170 people. And, and we are in the, in, the, in the area of prone, we are prone to epidemics. As you all know, um, Uganda has had multiple outbreaks um, of e Ebola, but also stemming mainly from, from South Sudan and Congo. And therefore, that was, uh, uh, of course, a, a, a blessing in disguise because that helped us also to, to set up uh, systems in our country that deal with epidemic. And, and therefore, by the time we got this COVID, we, we, had, we had been managing um, uh, uh, Ebola uh, that was coming from Congo and we had really established a very strong um, surveillance team in the country and especially under the, the border points. And, and so when we talk about Uganda, we are talking about actually low income state uh, or low, low economic um, state. And, and, and we, we know that in East Africa, for example, in Uganda, we, we, we still have many challenges, not only COVID, but by the time uh, COVID came, um, we were still experiencing um, high disease burden, malaria, TB, HIV, name it. And, and, and COVID was now another on top of, of what we had as a burden. Now this was another big burden on top of what we had. Um, we still have, uh, we're experiencing high maternal mortality and infant mortality. We are still also looking at health finance. We are, we are still, um, we, are, we are not yet where we want to get, but we know definitely that government over time has been increasing the funding, but I want to say that um, the per capita uh, funding for, for health is still low. We are also having the refugee burden uh, for us in Uganda, it was a, a, a policy that we cannot turn down anyone who comes and, and vulnerable in the country and therefore we share the little resources that, that we have with the refugees. And now even this time of COVID, that was another burden because already uh, we, we had over 1.5 million refugees in the country where we're taking care of them 
but at the same time also they continue coming even as I, as we talk now from Congo and South Sudan because of the civil wars and therefore all those were burdens um, that the country was grappling with. Now when when the, the, the COVID, when we reported the COVID the first, on 21st of March, uh, that by the time we registered the first COVID, we had already, the, the head of state is, is, is very, very strong on issues of, of public health. And so we had already established the, the, the ta national task force and also district task force, we just activated because these task forces were there because of the, the, the recent and, and recurrent uh, epidemics. Now, when, when we register, by the time we registered the first COVID, already the schools were closed and the, 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 we registered the first COVID and the following day we closed the, 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 the airport. And that early intervention was a very big strength for us because we were able now to minimize the, the people mainly who are coming from outside, who are coming through both the border points and the, and the airport, and, and, and therefore that helped us to, to reduce on, on, the, on the burden of the disease that, that was expected to come in as we were seeing that m many of the, the people who are coming from the countries already affected would come with the disease. Now, that was our strength and that remains our strength as Uganda. As I talk now, we have, we, so far we have registered uh, about eight, around 8,000 positives and 75 deaths. And Uganda, as I told you, the way we are situated uh, are in between the, 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 all these countries, we are the tr 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 transit uh, route. Uh, for example, those that are trading uh, to, to Tanzania from South Sudan, they, count, they go through Uganda. Those going to DRC from Congo, they go through Uganda. Therefore, we, we had also the challenge to, to, to man the, all the, 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 the port hills, the, the port of, of entry. I want to say that Uganda has over six, uh, 300, 365 uh, informal entry entry points where people can come through through Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda and, and, and South Sudan. And this was a big burden for us to, to man and make sure that we test everybody who would come through the country through all these border points. And therefore this was a big, big problem. But because as, as I had mentioned earlier, we have a very strong political uh, will uh, the, the president had to, 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 to institute the task force. And then we activated our, our local government structures that go up to the village level. And therefore we were using the village health teams. Every village has two health, health, health people who are able to report any case. And, and therefore we had to activate right from the, from the center, from the, the headquarters in Kampala, up to the village all over the country. And, 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 and we were activating that through that, that system. It was able to detect any person, anyone coming in the country, as long as they were regarded as non-Ugandan or Ugandan, but returning from, from different countries through the, the non-formal and, and formal uh, border entries. So that structure helped us a lot to keep on picking anyone who would come in and, and then we, we, we test. We have, oh, we, te we have tested so far a, a, a half a million and, and, uh, people, but we know that we can even get higher, but the, the challenges have been on access uh, uh, to test kits as I'm going to talk about that. Our, 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 our also openness helped us I know that in the region, you know the, the country I'm not going to mention, but you know where they don't declare anything. But for us, it was, it was a mandate that every case we must report, even the suspected, we must report. And it must be reported on a daily basis on the media on, so that everyone knows what is going on. And, and, and that helped us also that the population to be more alert and, and also to be proactive and, and that helped us actually 
to pick everybody who was suspected to have um, the infection and we, we test and also self quarantine or we put in institutional quarantine. At first, we thought it would be people would quarantine themselves in the in the in their homes, but it was very difficult, and therefore government had to make a decision to spend money to make sure that we we take care of everyone who'd come in the country suspected to have to to be coming from different uh, places, and we're able to quarantine other government expenditures. And those that were also sick, they they because of the, our policy, we have a strong policy of, of public health where everyone who accesses public facility must be treated for free. And, 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 and that helped for people to come forth and, 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 and get tested. We have also strong uh, uh, scientific advisory committee. Uh, the scientists have been working with us, uh, advising us and every day, every, every week we meet, uh, we have our strategic meeting where we interface with the scientists and we, we share the knowledge, we share the, 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 the research findings on a constant basis, and then we are able to inform our political leadership. Now, after, uh, of course, also government committed to, to provide financial support for the vulnerable groups. Because uh, at the time when we had the four weeks of lockdown, people, especially in urban areas, could not access food. So government had to commit and get food and, and, get, and get to all these people who are vulnerable, who had lost their job, especially in the informal sector. But, but I also want to say that there are clearly glaring global issues. One of them is that me at the center of, 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 of managing the health sector uh, resources it was very difficult to access test kits and was scampering and we saw that there was, there was, there was inequality because it was like, if we, if, we had, if we had the money, but we wanted to access the test kits, we had to wait. We had to wait because our orders were smaller compared to big economies and, and somehow it was like, you are the second best, you can wait. And, 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 and that really, there was a serious economic and, 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 and inequalities. Because there are, I, I can assure you there are some test kits we ordered and we had to wait for three months in the queue waiting to be given because maybe your orders are not big, maybe you are from Africa, maybe, you know, so, so that, that, that kind of thing. And, and it affected not only in Uganda, but even, even our, our sister countries. We also noted that there was a challenge of, of imbalance where you have to balance economic, economic gains. If you don't close the airport, more, more numbers of sick would come in. But if you don't close, you are going to get more people. But if you don't lock down, the infection is going to spread. Yet when you lock down, the businesses are going to collapse. And that issue to balance the two has been a big problem. And, and I think even now as a country, we have decided to open up and, and the airport is open, the borders are open. And, and that's why we are actually now seeing the, the, the numbers are, are increasing. The challenge of rapid testing, because we continue still to use PCR test, the antigen is just coming on board, but it has been a big problem and they are costly. So we as, uh, where we have the, the burden, of other diseases where we have to fund it. Now to also to get money to buy these test kits expensively and, and also treatment has been a problem. But I want to say that all is not lost. We have also seen the positives out of this COVID. We, in Uganda, we have seen that, that the diseases that are related to sanit sanitation have significantly come down because of just change your behavior, washing hands. We have seen the aerial diseases completely gone down. So that, 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 is, that is a good thing. The, the other thing we have also seen that it has stimulated the local manufacturing. We would wait to order for PPEs, to order from China, for order from where, then we take forever. The planes are not there to transport them. Local manufacturing, we have built capacity. We are able to manufacture all our PPEs, including 
N95 in the country. Actually, we are exporting now in the, in the, in the region. We have also seen that that scientific research, we are, government has committed to support 23 innovations, both in, in therapeutic, in vaccine, and also um, we, we are also using convalescent plasma. But we have seen government now more, more than ever before committing to research, to, to, and this should be an impetus even after post-COVID to, to, to take us through and also to commit more funds. Lastly, it is also the port health. Before we had outbreaks in the country, but we did not have capacity to set up laboratories at the border points. But right now, government has committed and we are going to establish infrastructure and, and laboratories so that in case of any trans, transnational uh, uh, disease outbreaks, we are able to handle quickly. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Twini. It's very, very interesting, and particularly to, to think about uh, the regional situation in which you, which you are and the disease burden that you already had before uh, COVID-19 uh, came into the picture as well, and the, the way in which you are approaching it. And I think a, a lot of uh, crossover in terms of the innovation uh, and in terms of the following the science, which is, which is very, very uh, encouraging. Uh, I now uh, have the pleasure uh, to give the floor last, but certainly uh, not least, uh, to uh, Professor uh, Lawrence Gostin uh, to uh, contribute his, his uh, expertise to our discussion. Uh, Professor Gostin is the longtime director of the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law at Georgetown University, and he also directs the WHO Collaborating Center on national and global health law. And I'm very pleased to say that he is also a very valued collaborator of IDLO. So it is a pleasure to give you the floor. Thank you very much, Jan. I really do appreciate that. And um, I am a very long time loyal admirer and partner of uh, uh, IDLO. Uh, so thank you. It's a great honor to be on this panel with just just astounding um, colleagues. Um, Helen Clark, who gave the keynote, is you know one of the people I admire most in the world. So thank you for organizing such a great panel. You know what I thought I would do um, is look at some of the kind of key touchstones of um, this pandemic. You know what are the lessons we've learned, and I want to just um, uh, cover um, first preparedness, uh, leadership, um, science, equity, vaccines, and then the importance of global institutions. I know that's a big agenda, but I think I can get through it fairly quickly. Um, you know, it was only, uh, we have to step back for a minute and just watch in awe of mother nature, because um, we don't take her as seriously as we should. <laughs> In, in areas like climate change, for sure, but also in infectious diseases. Um, as far as we know, sometime probably in early December, there was a zoonotic event um, where a, a microscopic virus we can't see uh, jump species from a bat through to an intermediary animal, uh, through to a human, probably in the Wuhan wet market. And then it swept like a tsunami um, through wider Hubei province in China, mainland China, uh, East Asia, um, Europe, um, the Americas, and now is marched relentlessly um, across the world, um, causing, as Helen said, many, many more than a million deaths, because those are only the recorded um, deaths. Uh, and so, it's interesting that having seen this enormous spread, um, that uh, even the most developed countries um, in Europe and North America um, were complacent. Um, they all had good health systems, um, but they were simply complacent. They weren't prepared. Um, it was like uh, Camus said, you know, uh, you know. Uh, we're, we're always uh, going through infectious disease outbreaks everywhere all the time, and yet one comes 
um, it rains on our head like a clear, you know, from a clear blue sky, like we never anticipated it. We all knew that this was a this event was coming. We all knew that no now that future events are occurring. So the first lesson is um, prepare, prepare in terms of uh, robust health system and public health infrastructure spending, um, surge capacity uh, in our hospitals, um, uh, personal protective equipment and other things that we need, and in biotechnology because we can make enormous strides um, with vaccines and therapeutics. Um, I was on a, a group, an international group called the Global Health Security Index. Um, before the pandemic that um, measured and evaluated um, all of the health system capacities of countries around the world. It's a complement to uh, the WHO's very effective joint external evaluation. Uh, we, we ranked the United States first in global health preparedness um, and the European countries very, very high. Um, but it turned out that the highest functioning health systems uh, often did um, very poorly um, in uh, the COVID response. And as Helen and others have said, uh, leadership matters and it matters a lot. Um, you can't unlock um, the, for, the, uh, the potential of a good health system unless you have good leadership and they rely on science. Um, and in many countries, uh, including my own in the United States, that was not the case. Which does lead me to science. If I were going to draw one lesson out um, of what countries that, that separated countries that performed well, you know, like New Zealand, uh, you know, Taiwan, Singapore, Germany, and others, and those that perform, performed badly, like the United States, you know, Brazil, Mexico, India. Um, it was the embrace or not embrace of science. Clear, consistent public health messages, um, because the only current way that we can stop this virus um, is by non-therapeutic interventions, um, universal masking, social distancing, testing, screening, uh, contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine. And so embracing science is important, not just in areas like the climate crisis, but in infectious diseases and, and all through public health. Um, and now to the really a core theme of, of this IDLO um, seminar, which is equity. Um, in, I've often said that, you know, Equity is, is, is the heart and soul of public health. Uh, justice is the heart and soul of public health and the rule of law. Um, and even before COVID-19, I would say that the singular prevailing global narrative was one of deep inequity and injustice. Uh, and Martin Luther King in the United States said something beautifully among so many beautiful things that he said. Uh, he said that all inequalities are unjust, but the greatest injustice are health inequalities. And he was right. Um, what our mother told us, if you've got your health, you've got everything, is true. Um, and we've seen the world have great prosperity um, I'm a, actually a, a great fan of globalization, trade lim liberalization, but there's no question um, that many have been left behind as the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals have said. Uh, the deep inequities in, in income, economics, social status, and in health are, are simply palpable and nobody can avoid but seeing them. Helen gave you some of the, the data and I could give you um, many more. Um, and COVID has just exasperated, ex exacerbated this. Um, you know, much of the world at one point uh, in 2020 was locked down, uh, completely locked down. And of course, you know, that, that applied to everybody, but it applied unequally. 
um, if we could uh, have the internet and a job where we could work remotely, if our food cupboards were well stocked, if we had an income, we would, we would be all right. Um, but if we were old, frail, disabled, um, a person with mental disability uh, or physical disability, um, if we were uh, homeless, if we were a frontline essential worker that had to go to work every day, um, if we needed to have our kids at school so that we could go to work today, we didn't fare, fare very well at all. So the inequities were, were palpable. In the United States, for example, um, the per capita death rate among black and native populations is more than four times greater um, than the white non-Hispanic uh, population in the United States. And we've seen this in other areas even before COVID, um, even in wonderful places like you know, Australia, New Zealand, Canada with their indigenous populations that have been left behind. Um, and now uh, the story of therapeutics and vaccines brings two of our key threads together. Um, one of these threads is the power of science, uh, and the other thread is the importance of equity and justice. So we are now on the cusp of having more than one safe and effective vaccine. Um, and uh, we have an unprecedented speed at their development. Um, there are currently nine um, phase three final um, vaccine candidates in phase three clinical trials. Um, dozens more in um, earlier stage clinical trials and hundreds more um, in preclinical trials. We've never seen anything like this. And so we probably will get a safe and effective vaccine, but there are concerns about countries that are rushing it, putting political pressure on scientists. Already um, three countries have approved or given emergency approval for a vaccine before the completion of phase three trials. That would be uh, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Russia, and China. Um, there's been enormous controversy in my own country in the United States about the White House putting political pressure on our regulatory agencies like the Food and Drug Administration. Um, but we need to have science play out along scientific lines, not along political or electoral lines. But equity is the big story of the vaccines because the vaccine is going to be a vast undertaking. Um, we have over 6 billion people in need of a vaccine around the world. It's likely that, that we'll have a two dose vaccine. So we'll need something like you know, 12 to 14 billion doses. Uh, we'll need to have uh, facilities for deep freeze storage and uh, transport of these vaccines. We need equipment like um, uh, needles and syringes. We need a health workforce that can deliver the vaccine. And we need it to be fully affordable and effective. I couldn't agree more with my fellow panelists that the, global, that the COVID-19 vaccine among all medical resources is a global public good, which means no country hoards it, um, no company owns it, and that it's uh, affordable and accessible equitably everywhere on the world, whether you're rich or poor, whatever your skin color or race or um, gender uh, or religion. Um, so vaccines are astounding. We have COVAX, the COVAX facility, a Gavi WHO initiative, which is simply stunning in its, uh, in its creation and, and its, um, uh, in its messaging and power. Um, and yet three of the superpowers have not joined, the US, China, and Russia. Uh, we need everybody to join it. And let me just finish by talking about the importance of uh, global solidarity and global institutions. As Secretary General Guterres aptly said, um, it's unconscionable that the World Health Organization would be caught in the middle of a geopolitical struggle in the midst of a pandemic. Um, 
I work with WHO for over 30 years. Um, you know, they can be bureaucratic and hard, but they are an amazing organization with amazing dedicated career professionals and scientists. Dr. Tedros um, is a person of great compassion um, uh, and great skill um, and has dedicated night and day along with his team. Uh, to have uh, a country like the United States where WHO was actually born in New York in 1948 um, and uh, to announce its withdrawal from WHO, um, to have WHO caught in this political struggle, um, uh, I think is, is entirely unhelpful. We have two paths that we can take um, that COVID will take us. It will either take us um, toward a path of nationalism, populism, my country first, me first, um, where the world splinters apart uh, and that we all go our own ways. Or we can realize that we're all in this together, um, that we need our scientists, we need equity, we need our global institutions to be strong and vibrant and well-funded and vigorous. Um, and I hope that, that, that now that we're right in the middle of this pandemic, and as we choose our path coming out of the pandemic, we choose a path of, of, of fellowship, of brotherhood, of sisterhood, of global solidarity, um, where we support um, our public health agencies, both nationally and globally, um, and that we come together as a humanity um, and lead the way um, in other areas that we face of grave challenges to our universe, uh, including climate crisis. So thank you very much, uh, Jan and IDLO, for, for this magnificent seminar. It's a deep honor for me to be part of it. Over to you. Thank you so much, Professor Gosselin, and I really uh, appreciate what you said about justice being at the heart and soul of, of public health. I think that we all uh, agree with that. We've had quite a number of questions come in and we can't take them all. So I'd like to thank everybody who has uh, raised a question. I'm just going to uh, ask uh, for two or three of them and then I will put them uh, back, to, uh, back to the panel. Um, so the first one is uh, Massimo Tomasoli. He is uh, from the International IDEA. Uh, you have the floor. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. Uh, I just wanted to uh, pose a question about uh, uh, the uh, vaccine justice. As uh, it was highlighted by many speakers, by Ellen Clark, and in particular by, uh, by Professor uh, Goslin. Now, the problem uh, is that uh, vaccines have been a, a triumph for both uh, science and democracy. And uh, uh, at this time, there are also uh, anti-scientific trends that are uh, uh, manipulated by political entrepreneurs in, in, in populism and nationalism uh, um, pleas for, uh, for uh, protecting uh, um, pretended interests, national interests. So how can the international community effectively make the uh, vaccine a global public good? We can state it as a principle, but what can actually be done? Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me go to a question uh, from Zhuang Zhu uh, from uh, the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Uh, you have the floor. Hello. Hello, please yeah, go uh, ahead. Yes, I just, uh, you know, a lot of panelists talk about um, um, the justice and about the legislation. So there's this uh, uh, command and control approach that has worked uh, uh, quite well in many countries, but there are also concerns about, um, um, you know, the potential, the possibility of infringement on, on personal freedoms, on privacy and on human rights. So I want to, the panelists to share 
uh, what in your in your view we can do to sort of uh, ensure that there's a proper balance between the command and control measures uh, to manage the crisis but also to uh, ensure uh, the full compliance with with human rights over to you thank you thank you very much and i, ha I have an, an another question here which is coming from uh, the uh, from Giorgio Cavalieri, who is from the permanent mission of Italy uh, to the international organizations in Rome, and it's uh, would be he would be interested to hear the views of the panelists on how best to address health disinformation on social media. So I wonder if we can turn these uh, these questions back to the panel and uh, get their get their ideas. Um, I wonder who who would like who would like to start. I can start with the vaccine. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, again, I'm f just for disclosure, I'm from WHO and, and thank you for, all for the kind words so far. It's a hard work. Uh, I, I have good news, Larry, because China has joined the COVAX facility. Oh, they have. How wonderful. Yes. Congratulations. <laughs> it's really good, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we. Yeah, it's, a, it's not a, a big amount because 10% of the Chinese population is a lot of people and a lot of money at the moment, right? But I, 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 I wonder if I could answer, start to answer to Mac Massimo's question about vaccine justice and, and think of, about it from the equity perspective, because I, I'm a medical doctor, not a lawyer, but it's a, to achieve justice. But uh, there are several things that are being put in place to to do our best to avoid what happened in 2009 when we had the H1N1. You know, and we've been working on this since April, March, April this year. And the COVAX facility is a result of this work together, the WHO and, and SEPI have done, and, and Gavi have done. Thinking that we should do our best to ensure that there, there is a timely access to all countries in the world at the same time. No, to the extent possible at the same time. What happened in 2009 with the G1 and 1 was that first the vaccines the, was free market, rich countries bought all the production. And when the vaccine became uh, not useful anymore because the pandemic had gone away, uh, the va vaccine was tried to dump in developing countries. So this was the, the main lessons learned that we had when we started discussing and thinking about an allocation framework that would set the ground for an equitable distribution, at least proportionally to all countries, right? So we were working around the principle of, in the full COVAX facilities based on this, that in the first year we would have at least 20% of the population being covered everywhere, you know, for those who joined the facility. The facility now has 169 or 170 with, a, with, a, with China. Uh, 92 uh, are countries who will receive the vaccines through the, 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 the ODA funding, and so it's not entirely covered yet. So we are calling that advanced mark committee. And then we have 69 or 70 countries that have, that are self-paying countries. That includes uh, upper middle income countries and, and high income countries. WHO yesterday launched the, the, express, the call for expression of interest for the emergency use listing or pre-qualification of a vaccine. Okay, so this is, uh, I think this is really good news. We're entering, uh, we already did emergency use listing for several diagnostics, right? We have two addressing the, what uh, the, uh, the colleague from Uganda has raised, Diana, on the, the antigen and uh, rapid test, diagnostic test, we have two of them uh, listed by WHO already, and there is an agreement for uh, uh, purchasing proc global procurement at five dollars each, which is still a little bit expensive. But in six months' time, we'll get less. But I would say that going back to the vaccines, we—it's not over, right? We have all this, like Larry said, nine on phase three, thirty-two in clinical trials. Does it mean that the nine will be successful? No, for sure they won't. You know. We are hoping to have uh, uh, some vaccines in the market, one or two successful vaccines available for initial distribution in the market in mid next year. 
So don't be fooled by, you know, one thing is to finalize a, a clinical trial, the, the phase three clinical trial. The other thing is to license it, license it somewhere. And then you, you still have the challenges of manufacturing and other challenges. Uh, like we don't know if it will need one or two doses. We don't know what, what kind of cold chain it will need. We, we still don't know which type of populations it will uh, protect. So there, but we are laying the ground for this. I, I think it's very unprecedented global uh, solidarity, I think. And uh, I was gonna build on when I heard the Secretary General once say that we needed to build on the enlightened self-interest of all nations. You know, and this is, this is very important at this moment. We need a global solution for vaccine access, but vaccine is not the only solution, but it's an important one. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mariangela. I think you answered a lot of people's questions with, with, that, with that answer. I want to, to go back to, to other panel members and also to, to hear again uh, from Helen before we close. So let me go first to you, Helen, because it's very, very late where you are. So please, uh, any, any comments you would like to make on what you've heard from the other panelists or from the questions? Yes, uh, comments first on the one from Zhu Wang Zhu uh, about uh, countries who rely on command and control measures to manage the crisis. And it, it is problematic. And as I said, we, we do see uh, countries which uh, keep measures around lockdowns in place for a long time, uh, seemingly then using it for reasons of political repression. And WHO is now on the record as saying, you know, don't keep going into, into prolonged lockdown because the uh, the implications for people, particularly those living on subsistence incomes, are very, very uh, severe. One of the great inequalities revealed by the crisis has been uh, you know, seeing seeing the, the faces on our television screens of, of people who are in a subsistence living saying, I'm going to die of hunger before I die of COVID because I can no longer trade on the, on the street or, or, or whatever. Uh, so really a lockdown should be used uh, to put in place measures uh, which will enable a country to uh, manage around uh, a pandemic without going into very severe lockdown again. But we are seeing some of these lockdowns go on for a very, very long time without seemingly the measures going in place which might enable uh, management at a, at a lesser level. The other question I thought was very interesting was the uh, the one from the permanent uh, uh, mission of uh, Italy, um, and particularly raising the issue about the infodemic. Now, the infodemic is a major problem uh, because to uh, get uh, populations to follow, you know, rational and reasonable public health advice like mask wearing and distancing and so on, uh, you don't need that undercut by. You know, the, the, the people who, who just insist on, you know, being able to do whatever they like when, whenever they like and question the wisdom of everything. And we're going to run into that obstacle, I think, with vaccines as well, because anti-vaxxers are a well-established and malign trend uh, long before uh, COVID-19 uh, came along. The problem with social media, of course, is it relies on what we call clickbait. The more controversial and silly, the more clicks, the more ads seen and so on. And again, it, it raises the issue of what is the role of regulation uh, for social media in democratic societies. We all appreciate the need for free speech, but you know, <laughs> we wouldn't let some of the, the, the things that are being said on social media uh, get past uh, uh, regulators in New Zealand, uh, voluntary uh, media regulation in the case of print and statutory in the case of, of radio and television. Uh, so, you know, you need some kind of bespoke regulation, I think, where social media companies do undertake to uphold proper standards of journalism and accept responsibility for content published on their platforms and do something about it, enable a process of, of truth telling. Look, uh, in, in New Zealand last weekend, an ad was published by a fringe political party uh, which made uh, ridiculous claims uh, with respect to COVID not being particularly uh, dangerous or deadly. 
This was immediately objected to under mechanisms that we have here uh, for objecting, and, and the Advertising Standards Authority has now slapped that party down and said the ad can't be run again. We need mechanisms to deal with, with falsehoods uh, on whatever media platforms are around. Thank you so much. I think that's another whole area um, that is just coming into prominence and, and clearly uh, another, another area that we need to think about more uh, as we move forward with governance uh, in relation to the pandemic. I want to give the floor for just a last quick word to um, the other panelists. Um, Dr. Um, Dr. Uh, Makaya Hayes, would you like to say a last word, a reaction? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to refer to the, uh, the disinformation aspect of this. And uh, in, in, for example, in, in Costa Rica, we have a very strong freedom of press. So it's, it's very hard to clamp down on, on misinformation from a, from a let's say, uh, uh, you know, a, a, an elimination of this type of, of information being being uh, shared, but we see this more as a competition for credibility. And very early on in this pandemic, we uh, use the daily uh, press briefings to give all the latest information, even if it was very bad news. And in Costa Rica, the pandemic started in the worst possible place, which is within our public hospitals. So the, the health centers where you were supposed to go to get cured was where this was spreading for the first time. And uh, we reported this, we isolated all the people that were close contacts and so forth. And that has been the, the tone ever since. And that has, I think, uh, resonated as th that the, the press conferences are a source of reliable, credible information. And so we can go out and, and um, contradict false information and uh, usually win that competition for credibility. Thank you so much. Dr. Atwine. Oh, I want to thank you all for the questions. Because of time, I will not go through that. But uh, I also want to mention the infodemic issue. I think the medicine for this, uh, what we have seen in our country, first of all, that openness so that information is available at all times when you want it, um, but also to have that regular briefs uh, right from the head of state to the minister every, every month. There's, there's a press conference uh, where all the information is provided and provided uh, that platform where the, the media want to ask any question, even when it is if it, the, most silly, the, the most silly questions, we entertain and we provide all the information, but also to, 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 to ensure that we, we let people speak so that we know where to go when you are providing information. And, and, and also the community engagement is very, very important because once there is mistrust and once there is distortion, then our public health interventions cannot take root or behavior change. But once we, we begin with the, the community and providing information at all times, that has been our, our strength. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And maybe a last uh, quick word, Professor Gostin. Yes, thanks. Um, I think most of it has been said, and Helen really, um, uh, said um, uh, really answered the the question that I that I want to answer, which is uh, the balance between human rights and public health. You know, it, it's a really really hard question. I, you know, after the 9/11 and the anthrax attacks, I uh, drafted at the request of the U.S. CDC the Model Emergency Health Powers Act, which was adopted throughout America and in many countries around the world. And I envisaged many of the things that happened, but I could never have imagined, you know, that a, a city the size of, you know, Wuhan, London, Delhi, um, uh, uh, Milan would be uh, locked down. Um, and that's exactly what we've seen. 
um, and the amount, the number of excess deaths that it's caused from other diseases, you know, other problems, poverty, um, spousal or, or child abuse, um, substance abuse, mental health concerns are, are staggering. And so the balance between public health and human rights and economic survival is one that is critically important. Uh, and we need more data to be able to say what works and at what cost. Um, so um, thank you for raising that. I think the importance of human rights uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic is absolutely essential. Well, thank you. I'd really like to thank all of the, the panelists. It's been a very, very interesting discussion. Uh, I think that we've, uh, without a doubt, um, understood that uh, effective governance is key to uh, delivering good results here. And I think that the, the lessons that, that Helen laid out in the keynote have, have been, uh, in, a, in a way, um, expanded on by, by each of the speakers, the, the, the absolute importance of the planning and, and the leadership and the leadership from the top, the political will, but also going right down to the local level, the, the absolute importance of following the science, the importance of the, addressing the inequities and focusing on the most vulnerable and the social determinants, uh, particularly this issue of engaging communities. I think every, every speaker um, spoke about it and also transparency and openness and and communication, which also the other side of it is the is the misinformation uh, issue that we just uh, talked about. And then I think on, on the global level, the issue of the, the solidarity, and, and there I think there are some positive elements, as, as Maria Angela and others have said, we think that, you know, COVAX is, is something uh, very, very uh, impressive, um, but there's a lot further to go and a lot of other areas where we need that solidarity, including maybe in the Security Council and other places where we have not been uh, we have not been seeing it. Um, so I just would like to thank everyone. Uh, I wanted to ask Helen, would you like to give us just one, one final uh, word uh, before we uh, can let you go to bed? It's so, so late in New Zealand and I just want again to say how much we appreciate uh, you joining us and giving us the benefit of your, of your great uh, experience on these issues. Helen. Perhaps just a heads up, uh, the independent panel on Pandemic Preparedness and Response, which I'm co-chairing with former president of Liberia, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. We do have a website. We've already posted on that the terms of reference, the record of our first meeting, the work program will go up shortly. We will be calling for submissions and we will also be finding a way for the general public to make uh, views known to us as well. Uh, we're, we're following a process of what I call truth telling, but not blame casting. Truth telling is constructive, blame casting isn't particularly. So finding out, you know, establishing authoritatively what happened when, uh, what was the response like, what lessons can we learn and what pragmatic things could we recommend uh, for, for the future. We want this to be a very practical. We don't want a, a sort of fluffy woolly report with high level uh, exhortations. I think people want to know how could we do better next time as a world. So that that's our focus. But please check out the website and the and the Twitter site at the end panel. Thank you so much, and we wish you all the best um, with this panel because it's really extremely important for the future of of all of us. And I will I'll say that IDLO is committed to uh, work with with partners at country and at global levels to um, really contribute in the way that we can to the global response and the recovery and particularly uh, to support countries with developing policy frameworks that are rooted in the rule of law because I think that only in that way are we going to create the resilient societies, the just societies uh, that are going to enable us to get out of uh, this pandemic and, and other um, similar shocks. I want to, to thank all of the panelists. It's really been a, a global conversation today. I want to thank all of you who've joined us. We will be continuing uh, with these forums, bringing different aspects um, of the subject um, to this kind of uh, discussion, and we look forward to seeing you next time. So thank you very much, and goodbye. Bye.